you very much. Hopefully you can all hear me. Talking up the hill is a little different. Tyler Borkowski is my assistant general manager. Uh, nine months ago he came to me as a job seeker. And about a month ago we named him the assistant general manager. So there is a way you can move through this career pretty quickly. Keisha Tillman, I assume most of you, if not all of you, know who Keisha is. Keisha earlier tonight said that I've, I've known her since she was in high school. She was exaggerating. I'm not that old. But anyway, Keisha and I worked together for the, in Durham, the Durham Bulls, and Baseball America Magazine many, many, many moons ago. And Keisha and, and uh, Marty were the ones that extended the invitation to me to come and speak to you. And I never turned down the opportunity to talk to young folks. I, I enjoy it tremendously. I've had over 200 interns work for me over the years. I still keep track of 150 of them, probably, uh, through Facebook and things like that. And nowadays, they're getting old enough to get married, <coughs> which makes me feel a little bit older. But generally, I believe strongly in the youth of our country. I, I talk to a lot of civic groups, and they're old men, unlike me. And they're all complaining about your generation, the one right in front of yours, that you guys aren't going to be ready to lead America. And my answer to them is they're hanging out with the wrong young people. Because I know every one of you are going to be able to take us as a nation to do and, and greater things and as business leaders. And hopefully maybe one or two of you decide to make a career in baseball. Uh, it, it's, it's pretty awesome. And, I, and again, I believe in what you guys stand for and what your, your, your peers do as well. So it's important. And I live that. I live that. I'm old enough in my career. 2017 will be my 40th season in baseball. And uh, I feel pretty much the same as I did when I started back in uh, Savannah, Georgia. The first minor league baseball game I ever saw was on the payroll of the team. Uh, I grew up in uh, Dutchess County, New York, and going to the stadium was going to Shea Stadium. And I was really lost, Yankee Stadium, but never to a minor league ballpark. First minor league game I had any connection to was on the radio. You guys remember what radio was? Now you know. But AM radio. Rochester, New York, AAA baseball team affiliated with the Baltimore Orioles. I uh, just stumbled upon their game one. I had an old transistor radio with a long screen, all the numbers across. And I took a piece of masking tape and I taped it on there and I marked every spot on that radio dial where I found the baseball game. So all the major league games you could buy the Mets, Yankees, the Phillies, the Red Sox, uh, the Orioles in those days, I could pick all of those up on this AM radio. And by chance one night, I found the Rochester Red Wings. I fell in love with minor league baseball at that point and decided that's what I wanted to do uh, career-wise. So I would write letters to minor league baseball teams. And I would say there were 140, 160 teams uh, in minor league baseball in those days. And I would get 20 or 25 percent would write back to me with the same two lines, you know, basically. We don't have any jobs. Try again next year. Some of the teams actually wrote on the back of my letter which I thought was the ultimate put down. They couldn't even spare a piece of their stationery. But they wrote on the back of mine that they didn't have any jobs. So I tried that for two years, just writing letters, writing letters. And uh, was fortunate enough to go to the winter meetings in Los Angeles. Winter meetings are the annual convention of professional baseball. It takes place in December. I went to LA. I, every dime I had got me there. I was there for 11 days. I interviewed for one job. And it was in Asheville, North Carolina. And they offered me $50 a month to move from New York to what I thought was the end of the earth, North Carolina. And uh, I turned him down. And he said, you say no, someone will say yes. Well, I was gambling that the winter meetings would be closer to New York the following year than Los Angeles. So the last day of the winter meetings in LA, there's a big gathering, and they announced the, I guess it was the 1977 winter meetings would be in Honolulu, Hawaii. So it wasn't quite closer to New York. But the big news is there were over 100 job seekers in Los Angeles. There were 11 job seekers in Hawaii. And I was one of them. And I got my first job there. I went from New York to Hawaii to Savannah, Georgia for my first job. And after that, I never interviewed for another job. And I, as I said, I've been doing this for, for a very long time. One of the great times I had career-wise was Memphis, Tennessee. Team called Memphis Redbirds. AAA affiliate, St. Louis Cardinals. I was named president and general manager in 2001. And uh, we were not for profit. We were the top grossing team in minor league baseball. 
roughly $19 million in our gross revenue. We gave all of our money away. We didn't keep it for ourselves. We, we had two youth programs we supported. One was an RBI program, Major League Baseball, it was a similar program. For the kids in the inner city, during the day, they would come out and play baseball, Monday through Thursday, baseball and softball, Monday through Thursday. And on Friday, we had life skills. We taught them things that you all take for granted. And I did say you all, I'm sorry, I lived in the South for a long time. But we taught them how to read the help wanted ads for a job. How do you do that? How do you open a bank account? How do you dress for a job interview? All those things that you guys would take for granted. They did, the inner city kids didn't know that. They were exposed to that. So we weren't looking for baseball players. We were looking for the next generation of Memphis civilians, people who were going to lead our community. And we thought we could do it through baseball, and we did that. The other program we had was called Stripes. Uh, Memphis civic leaders years ago, probably 20 years ago now, 25 years ago, dropped baseball and softball from their middle schools, the junior high schools, middle schools. There was no, no baseball in school. We had 40 schools like that in the city of Memphis. So in 1990, 1998, when the regulars were formed, we put baseball back in all 40 of those schools, baseball and softball. And we did that, again, not looking for baseball players, but trying to build the character of those. You can learn a lot through playing the game of baseball. But also in Memphis, because we were not for profit, we had to generate as much revenue as we could. And one of the ways we did that is we had major league exhibition game every spring. Usually it was the Cardinals, our major league affiliate, and another team. They didn't come for free. We had to pay them a quarter of a million dollars to come, plus pay their hotel, plus pay their travel. That's a lot of money to come out of a, a medium-sized city like Memphis. But we did it year after year. We sold the, if we sold the game out, we had 14,000 seats in our zone park. We could make a little money, break even. All the ticket revenue would go to the major league teams. We made our money on concessions and merchandise and some, some corporate sponsors like AutoZone and FedEx, two of the bigger companies in, in Memphis. But one year, the Cardinals would come for whatever their reason was. We ended up with the Toronto Blue Jays and the Cincinnati Reds. And Ken Griffey Jr. was playing for the Reds. That was the only, only draw we had. We didn't sell out the game. I, I came $1,000 short from covering the quarter million dollars expense. Very unhappy about that. Because we were not for profit, all of our excess cash went back to the community, as I, as I told you. So I'm driving to work the next day. I'm trying to think, there's got to be a better way for me to do this major league exhibition business. It's too expensive to give away the first quarter of a million dollars. So I'm driving in, what, do, what, what, does, what does my city, what does Memphis have that no one else has? We have a great ballpark. A lot of teams have a great ballpark. A great fan base. A lot of teams have a great fan base. But then I decided we have the Civil Rights Museum, the National Civil Rights Museum, which is the Lorraine Motel. Anybody know the significance of the Lorraine Motel? You're, you're, you're killing me. You're killing me. Martin Luther King Jr. Amen. You got it right. Martin Luther King was assassinated <coughs> on a balcony at the Lorraine Motel, April 4th, 1968. And the city of Memphis pretty much went into a major decline after that. Most of downtown closed. Uh, there was a hotel, very famous southern hotel called the Peabody, uh, that closed its doors. It's right across the street from one of those parts. When we built our ballpark downtown, $80 million ballpark, uh, most expensive ballpark built for minor league baseball in 14, 15 years, the record was just broken by El Paso. We helped bring back the city of Memphis. The, the Peabody reopened, the retail came back downtown, restaurants came back downtown. The people that founded this organization that brought me to Memphis believed in Memphis, believed in the game of baseball. And they also taught me, guy, you're not running the typical minor league baseball team. This is unique, because at that time we were the only not for profit that owned the ballpark and owned the baseball team. There's now one other in the country. So we got to think outside the box. We need to grow revenue. And obviously with Major League Exhibition Games, I was giving more revenue away than I was, I was growing. But driving to work, I said, I had a civil rights museum. The game of Major League Baseball is basically a white person's game. More white people, players play, attend the games. So baseball was screaming for ways to get into the African-American community. Historically, baseball was a way for the African-American players to get out of their living conditions and develop a career in baseball. As I fully made, Bob Gibson, uh, Lou Brock, dozens of them. The game had shifted away that. I think the minority participation is the same, but the minority itself changed. It's now Asian players and Latin players, not the African-American players. 
So I knew baseball needed had, needed to have a, a, a place to promote itself to the African American community. And we had the civil rights people. So I'm driving to work, and I decide, here's what I'm going to do. I'm going to go to the commissioner's office in New York, tell Bud Sealing that I want two major league teams assigned to AutoZone Park the week of April 4th. April 4th is the assassination date. We don't celebrate the assassination, we commemorate it. And we, we, we use it to bring our community together. And they're going to bring those, they're going to give me those teams for free. And what I'm going to do is I'm going to give the quarter million dollars away. I'm still going to give it away. But I'm going to give a big chunk of it to the Civil Rights Museum. We're going to give a big chunk of it to the NCAA Education Fund. Or NCAA, NAACP Education Fund. Not the NCAA, they got nothing. They got nothing. But we're going to give it away to a number of charities that want to give back. We're also going to create a series of awards. Major League Baseball players make a lot of money. We all know that we all think they're filthy rich and they're, and they're greedy and they don't give. Well, the reality is Major League Baseball players give away tons of money. So we wanted to celebrate those players that gave money back to youth programs. So we created something called the Beacon Award. And we would honor players at a, at a luncheon during the, uh, the Civil Rights game. But I had to sell this game. I had to sell Major League Baseball and giving me a quarter million dollars worth of players. So I got to my office the next morning. I called my VP of Marketing in my office, and I'm going to tell you something right now that you cannot repeat. Because if you repeat it, they're going to lock me up and tell, me, tell you that I'm, I'm crazy. The Major League Baseball is going to give us two teams, and we're going to give all the money for it. So don't tell anybody, but I played out the scenario for him. And he said, "This no one loses in this. The Memphis Redbirds Foundation, we win. The City of Memphis wins. The Civil Rights Museum wins. The other youth programs win. Major League Baseball wins. So we put together a very small group, select, hand-picked civic leaders, and I presented the idea to them. And right away, everybody said, let's do a PowerPoint. And I said, no, PowerPoint's old. Even I think PowerPoint's old. And I said, come on, you, you guys can be allowed. You're allowed to laugh. <laughs> you know, you can do all this. So I said, the PowerPoint's old fashioned. Let's create we hit one of our folks there was a videographer over a, a company that did a lot of promotional videos for us and other people in the market. And I said, I want you to do a video. And we're going to send that video to New York. And we're going to send it to the commissioner's office. And they're going to say yes. They're going to say yes to this. My founders told me I was crazy. They said it would be at least a two-year project to get it approved. Um, most of the people on the committee didn't believe it was going to happen. But what I want to start off with, that's a long way to answer, but I, started, I want to start off with showing you the DVD, the video that we created that sold Again, thinking out of the box, that sold Major League Baseball on the idea of the Civil Rights Act. Mr. Borkowski, you're up. You're working on it. Who's in charge of it? Tennessee, shot in the face as he stood alone on the balcony of the hotel room. He died in the hospital an hour later. Life is about making opportunities out of adversities, taking calamitous events and turning them into chances for progress or advancement. I may not get that with you. In Memphis and the Mid-South, the legacy of Dr. Martin Luther King, Jr. serves today as the inspiration for one of the great ongoing chances for progress in the struggle for civil rights, the National Civil Rights Museum. The aftershock of the assassination of Dr. Martin Luther King, Jr. would plunge the Lorraine Motel a small minority-owned business in the south end of downtown Memphis, into a long and steep decline. The motel's owner kept two rooms as shrines for Dr. King and to the owner's wife, Lorraine, who died of a brain hemorrhage just hours after Dr. King's death. By 1982, the Lorraine Motel was a foreclosed property. A group of men 
champions concerned this historic site would be lost formed the Martin Luther King Memorial Foundation to save the Lorraine and created the nation's first comprehensive exhibit chronicling America's civil rights movement. On September 28, 1991, the National Civil Rights Museum opened its doors to visitors. Today, the museum transports hundreds of thousands of visitors each year through the sites and landmark events that shaped our nation. And Memphis, the National Civil Rights Museum, and the Memphis Redbirds, the St. Louis Cardinals AAA affiliate, proposed to partner with Major League Baseball to turn another adversity into opportunity. Across the United States, African American participation in baseball is in dramatic decline. In Memphis, this is changing. The Memphis Redbirds, America's only not-for-profit sports team and facility, return every penny of operating profit back to the community to fund programs bringing baseball to kids in the inner city and to middle schools where the sport was scrapped due to budget cuts in the 1990s. Stop right there. Keep everything in front of you. We can up to the second base. Coaches use baseball as a tool to teach youngsters life lessons about dealing with adversity. I want the kids to learn good sportsmanship. I want them to care about other people. I want them to be responsible citizens in their communities. Kids learn character counts. You have to show character uh, on and off the field. Without character, you have nothing. In April 2007, we hope to bring these messages of change to the nation and the world as we present the National Civil Rights Game. Occurring near or on the anniversary of Dr. King's death, and serving as the culmination of spring training and the start of the regular season. This game and surrounding events would feature a nationally televised Major League Exhibition game from Autotone Park. Minor League Baseball's crown jewel. I remember when we first opened it, uh, I thought, man, this is going to be the nicest facility in the, in the country for Minor League Baseball. And it's a jewel enriching the entire community. I think it's wonderful that the community can share in, in the success of the team, both financially and artistically, and it's just to develop the community and baseball closer together, and I think that's a great thing. It gives everybody a good feeling walking into this ballpark, knowing that when they spend money here, and they buy tickets to watch baseball here, that it's money that's going to go back into the community. One major event surrounding the game would be the annual presentation of an award to an individual who's used the game of baseball to make a positive impact. The award would be modeled after the National Civil Rights Museum's Freedom Award, which annually honors leaders in the civil rights movement. Past recipients have provided valuable exposure for the museum and its message, and we envision this award providing positive publicity, not just for its recipient, but for the game of baseball. Baseball's history is long and rich. Legends of the game loom large, casting shadows over future generations. Their message has the power to inspire and instill a sense of pride, passion, and purpose in our children. Hello, I'm Benjamin Hook. As a past president of the National NAACP, and one of the co-founders of the National Civil Rights Museum, I have spent my entire life crusading for civil rights. I urge the leaders of Major League Baseball to come to our great city of Memphis and learn more about our innovative idea and help us further not just this great movement, but the great game of baseball itself. I personally invite you to be my guest at your earliest possible opportunity. Let us keep the National Civil Rights Museum alive and vibrant and well. And let us return baseball as a major sport in the inner cities. I look forward to seeing you in Memphis. Thank you. When that uh, DVD arrived in, at uh, Park Avenue in New York City, <clears throat> within a couple of days, I had a call from them asking for 25 copies. 
because they thought every decision maker in the commissioner's office should see it. And then within weeks of that, they awarded us the Civil Rights Game. And we hosted it for two years as a preseason, end of spring training exhibition game. And uh, since 2009, it is part of the regular season schedule for Major League Baseball. The bad news is they took it from Memphis. But the good news is an idea that was born there, created there, nurtured there, by thinking outside the box, is now a regular part of Major League Baseball. So it's pretty special. Um, I love the game. I've, I've served the game for 39 years. This is probably the, the biggest part of my, my baseball legacy. And I've done lots of other things that I'm equally proud of, but the Civil Rights game was unique. One of the things that baseball allows is it, it connects people. It connects, as I mentioned earlier, generations. I'll tell you a story about that. But also, in, uh, in the years are getting fuzzy as I get younger. Uh, but during the 94-95 season when we had the, the strike, the labor problems, the cancellation of the World Series was going on. And then after that, we got into the PED uh, controversy and dispute in the early 2000s, the congressional hearings. By the way, nothing worse than watching a congressional hearing, listening to politicians tell you about home runs that they think they hit when they play Little League Baseball. It's a total waste of time. And I'm watching these hearings. I love the game. Everything I have in this game. I met my wife at Durham Athletic Park where the movie Bull Durham was, was filmed. How many of you have seen Bull Durham? Your parents aren't here. It's okay. You can say you watch Bull Durham. Um, so that, you know, that, was a, that was a big part of, of what I was trying to do. And I'm in Memphis, and I love it. Again, the game of baseball is important. During these, these hearings were going on, I was watching them in my office. My daughter was, young daughter was with me, and I'm talking to the television. I'm talking to the politicians, wishing they would shut up. I'm, I'm embarrassed by the leaders of the game that I have given my life to, making the game look silly. Obviously, lying about performance enhancing drugs, players lying, the commissioner's office passing out blank pieces of paper as part of the report to the congressman. I was embarrassed. So my daughter informs me, as an eight-year-old can tell you, that they really can't hear you, Dad. They can't hear you. And I said, they will. They will hear me. I took her home, picked up my other daughter, and we went over to Jackson, Tennessee, a small. I'm a history buff. I love history beyond belief. My kids, since the days they were born, we went on history trips. There's a small Civil War battlefield in Jackson. And I wanted to break away from what I was watching that television. I said, her name is Alec. I said, yeah, let's go. So she regularly went with me. We toured the Civil War battlefield for a little while. We're driving back home and instead of taking the interstate, took uh, Highway 70 instead. We stopped in Brownsville, Tennessee because she wanted a bottle of water. And because I worked in the publishing industry for so long at Baseball America, when I see a vending machine that had a newspaper in it, I got to pump the quarters in there to get out whatever's inside. So the daily or the weekly, whatever it was in Brownsville, was in there. And I bought the water, I get the newspaper, I go home, the hearings are still on, so I decide to read this newspaper. On the back page of the newspaper, there's a big story about the high school baseball team. New coach, team picture, schedule, preview of the season. And inside was a full page story about a clinic that the high school players hosted for the little kids in town. I said, that right there is what baseball is really all about. Not billionaire owners fighting with millionaire players. That's not what the game really is about. It's about community. So the next day in the office, I ran a letter to the baseball coach. Never met the guy. His name is, his name is Tyler Fawcett. He's no longer the coach there. But I wrote him a letter. And I said, yesterday was a bad day for the game that I love. A little bad day. And I played it out a little bit in the letter. And I said, but I read your, your local newspaper. I found out what you're trying to do in your community with your high school baseball team. And to reward you for believing in the game of baseball, here are 50 tickets. Be my guest at a Redbirds game. And if you need more, I want families to come. I want brothers and sisters to come. Certainly, I want your players to come. But if you need more tickets, call me. So he called me and he said, I met with the team. They're very excited about coming. We have one request. You come and watch us play before we come to watch you play. Seemed reasonable enough. I had the schedule. It was in the newspaper. I was ready to go. So I go over there one afternoon. I get there in the middle of the JV game. The score is about 715 to 1. I mean, the team is, the home team is getting clogged. 
mercy rule, the game is over early, thank goodness. And the coach also drags the field and does the, the lines, Ty Hart's done all those jobs as well. Um, and he gets off the track and I'm just similar to this, and he walks up to me and says, you must be Dave Chase. And I said, how do you know that? He said, look around, you're the only person here wearing a blue blazer. I said, okay, and I'm Dave Chase. He said, well, you stayed for the all of the second game. I said, rule number one, if you arrive at a game before it starts, you don't leave until it's over. So yes, I'm here for the duration. That was the good news. The bad news is the varsity team wasn't any better than the JV team. And they were getting beat pretty badly. If you played on a bad baseball team, what would be the worst position to play? Picture they have relief pictures, you can get relief. I would try another one. Who knows who Bob Euchre is? Nobody. Uh, he was a major league catcher who was very bad. And he believed the way you caught the knuckleball was you wait for it to stop rolling when it hits the backstop and then you run and get it. <laughs> okay? So in my opinion, the worst position on a bad baseball team would be the catcher. You're chasing balls back to the backstop. The other team is scoring runs. You need a counter to keep track of the score. Bad position. Young man on this team. I didn't know him. I didn't know anybody on the team. I barely knew the coach only from the phone call. But I watched the young man as a catcher. Very frustrating, dusty, dirty, they don't water the field, so it's dust everywhere. I never saw him lose his cool. I never saw him yell at the pitcher. I never saw him fire the ball back to the pitcher in anger. He was, he was impressed. I was impressed by him. And after the game, I go up and I'm getting ready to leave, and the coach says, whoa, 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 he can't go. The team, both teams, the JV team and the varsity team, want to, they want to hear from you. They want you to talk to them. I said, Coach, you just got your rear end kicked from one end of this field to the other. Not once, but twice. Do you really want me to, to prolong this? And he said, turn around. The teams were sitting behind second base, on the grass, waiting for me to come and talk to you. I had no idea what I was going to say. Zero. And Tyler will tell you I had no idea what I was going to say to you tonight, either. But I went back and talked. And I said, guys, you really had a tough day on this baseball field today. A real tough day. But I'm going to tell you something. The odds are of one of you guys, on either of those teams or the visiting team, to play one at bat or throw one pitch in a Major League Baseball game is almost zero. Almost zero. And if you do sign a pro contract and you start off in the lower levels of minor leagues, you have a 6% chance of getting one at bat or throwing one pitch in a Major League Baseball game. So at the end of the day, guys, you've got to take something else from the game of baseball other than hoping you're going to go make millions of dollars playing in a Major League City. But you're not. So you learn teamwork. You learn how to deal with adversity. You learn how to get along with others. You learn different cultures. All of these things you get from the game of baseball. And I said, that's the lesson you've got to take from tonight. Not winning and losing, because you really set the mark pretty high for losing. Um, but I said, now you're going to come to AutoZone Park as my guest, bring your families, and we'll let you see what the pro game is like. Oh, that was, that was a pretty good trade, I thought, for them. The catcher, his name is R.J. Young, came up to me and thanked me for everything and all those kinds of things. And he was looking forward to coming to AutoZone Park. He was one of the guys that didn't quite get the message that you're probably not going to play pro baseball. R.J., I learned later on, and R.J. and I became friends, and I just heard from him a couple days ago. Um, Really tough family background, tough at school, wasn't going to play college baseball. Pretty much translates that you're not going to play pro baseball. But he loved the game of baseball. The, the team comes to Memphis. I meet them at the front gate, and they all parade off the buses, and the, their moms and dads are telling me how special I made today for them. Made me feel good. And then the coach says, we got a presentation to make to you. Really? That's kind of cool. So all the team got all around me in the, in the entry plaza at Arbor's own park. And RJ said, Here, we have a gift for you. And in the South, they call you Mr. on your first name. So Mr. Dave, here's a, here's a gift for you from all of us. There was an autographed baseball from the uh, Haywood County Tomcats. It's the name of their high school team. And he gave it to me. I have a collection of autographed baseballs from Hall of Famers, World Series teams, All-Star teams, Every team I've managed, or been the general manager of in minor league baseball, I have all of those. 
That night, I went to my office. I took all of those baseballs away, put them in a box. They've never been out of the box since 1994, uh, 2005, I guess it was 2005. The only baseball on my desk for the rest of my time in Memphis was the Tomcats baseball. When I, just, when I was having a bad day, and believe me, when you go to work at a ballpark every day, there weren't too many bad days. But occasionally there is one. Or if someone in the National Open does something I didn't like in my baseball. I looked at that baseball. That baseball reminded me of what the game was all about. That's how important it was. And I'll report to you that RJ is married, has three beautiful kids, full time job, just bought his first house. And I hear from him regularly. That's what baseball can do. It brings people together. Uh, somebody I probably never should have known was RJ Young. And that was a very important part of my life. At the end, I'll tell you, I'll tell really another story to you, but I, I, in the last few days, I've lost a young person that was part of Dave's guys. And RJ was one of the guys that sent me a message on Facebook telling me that, you know, you'll get through this. You help me, <coughs> you will also help. You will also help this young man. So that's what the game does for me, it's very personal. It's not runs, hits, and errors. I, I love to hear the but I didn't watch any of this World Series. Um, but it's, it's that kind of thing that baseball does. The other thing that the game does, and uh, when, I was at, when I was the publisher of Baseball America, every summer I would do a 10 day to two week trip. The only rule was I ended every game in a ball. It was a college game, a minor league game, a major league game. One night it was even a little league game. I know nobody that's playing these games, basically. But I was in Syracuse, New York, AAA baseball, Toronto Blue, then the Toronto Blue Jays still there. Virtually no one there, which is when I like to go to games when no one's present. Now, when I run the team, like in Sussex County or Memphis or any of the other stops I've made, I want the ballpark full. But when I'm going as a fan, I really like it empty because then I can keep scoring, I can watch the game at the level I want to watch. In front of me were four, you know, well, four men, probably from 12 years old to you know, 80, 90 years old. Four guys. Ballpark's empty, so I can hear the whole conversation. They spent three hours of a baseball game. Talking baseball. Pretty, pretty unique. Think in your own life. Did you talk for three hours to your father or your grandfather about music? <laughs> Literature? Television? Video games? Maybe family stories that you've all heard a million times you don't want to hear anymore. But the game of baseball allowed that conversation across those generations to share their opinions on favorite ball players or how the game hasn't changed. That's awesome. Anybody know Doris Kearns Goodwin? Presidential historian, most recent book I think is on Lincoln, Lincoln and Team of Rivals. She's a big baseball fan. She grew up in, in Long Island as a Brooklyn Dodgers fan. And she learned to keep, in those days, all the game was in daytime. She learned to keep score. When her father would come home at night for dinner, she would do the play-by-play -play from her notes, from her, her scorecard, her score sheet. She didn't know that he read the afternoon paper on the train when he left Manhattan to come home and only knew what happened to the Dodgers that day. She thought she was his connection to the game. So we had father and daughter connection. I learned my passion for, game, for the game from my grandma. My mom and dad could care less. I thought it was a big waste of time. Well, my grandmother would tell me stories of growing up when she was a little girl, that she could ask her father for all kinds of money, and all kinds of money meaning a nickel or a dime, and get it if the Giants had won, New York Giants. The New York Giants lost, we're not getting anything. But she had that passion. I spent my summers with her. Her whole life, this is pre-cable. So it was Mets and Yankees on WOR and WPIX, whichever one was on. That was, her day was focused on that TV, on that game. And that's where I learned my passion goes through her. But you can do this time after time with families and see how the game is passed down generation to generation. The game itself allows you, for the most part, to talk to the people you're sitting next to when you go to a game. Unlike the NBA or NFL, where there's just so much noise. Fortunately, Major League Baseball is getting that way now. But you can't have that exchange. But normally, you go to a baseball game, you can talk to people. You might even just spend that whole evening talking to somebody you never would have talked to other during North Carolina, a city that I worked in for 18 years. The community is split. You got Duke University, 
and you got old tobacco dirt. They don't cross paths too often. But one place they did was Durham Athletic Club. First of all, we sold a 16 ounce beer for a dollar. And that was the regular price. That wasn't a beer night promotion. We didn't, we didn't do beer nights. Uh, but that's where the community came together. They talked to each other. They never would have talked to any other time. That's the beauty of the game of baseball, I think. I believe in the game so much more than just runs, hits, and everything. It connects me with young people, like Tyler and hundreds of others that I've dealt with over the years. It allows me to do that. It allows you to walk into, I walked into Anderson, South Carolina, which really was the end of the world as far as I was concerned. You were up in South Carolina, you got to be kidding me. Within days, I was Mr. Baseball in, base, in Anderson, South Carolina. You can't, I, I could own 20 McDonald's in Anderson, South Carolina, and no one would know who I was. But because I was the general manager of a very small minor league baseball team that had moved from Greenwood, South Carolina, to the big city of Anderson, I was Mr. And I was able to use the game there, hire a lot of young people. I'm, they were in high school when I hired them back in 19, 1980. And I'm still friends. I'm still associated with a lot of those folks. That's the beauty of it. So that, that's, where, that's where I get my charge of what, what baseball can do. I've talked a lot about the game from a community point of view, not so much from the runs, hits, and errors, and I don't intend to talk about runs, hits, and errors. But talk about what the game can do. We brought baseball back to Sussex County. May 25th, 2015 was our opening day. Baseball had been gone for four or five years. The baseball history had been pretty ugly. We have a new owner, bought the field, bought the stadium, bought the surrounding area, and invested about $3 million in the, he reminds me quite often that he's invested $3 million in a team that's losing money. And I've got you know, one more year to get to break even, and then maybe a third year to get it to make money. But when you see the look on the faces of the people that we brought baseball back to, they have long memories. There was a Cardinals affiliate for a while. There was an independent team for a while. And they have vivid memories of that. Opening night, May 25th, we had lines like you'd never, they'd never seen. Our capacity is about 4,000, 4,200, and we were about 3,800 people. And people were complaining to me that they were standing in line. So I said, all right, tell me about the last game you came to. Well, there was no line. You knew everybody by their first name, probably, because there were only about 50 of them there. And I said, don't you want to go home tonight, go to work tomorrow, and tell your friends that you were part of this gigantic crowd at Skyline Stadium? Take pride in your community is now supporting the baseball this way. It'll work. Probably not. We, but we, if we had fireworks on Saturday night, we would draw 3,000 people. On a Tuesday night, you know, we might get, we might, we might have more tires in the parking lot than we have people in the stadium. But it's the beginning. It, it, it taps into what is important to community. And that's what baseball really is. If you're interested in this at all, based on the civil rights game or baseball's role in integration. Baseball integrated before Jackie Robinson, by the way. Minor league baseball integrated first. Uh, after Jackie Robinson, the U.S. military integrated under the leadership of Harry Truman. It wasn't until the 60s that schools even got close to integration, a lot of it under the leadership of President Kennedy and President uh, Lyndon Johnson. And then when you read the headlines today, you really, when you read the headlines today, you have to wonder who made any progress. I believe we have. We've still got a long way to go, and that's your job, is to get us the rest of the way as a country, is, is to continue that legacy. The way to continue the legacy is understand the history. I'm a big believer in Studying history. Profiles of courage. Anybody read it? Where's the faculty members around here? Come on, guys. I had a politician come to see me in Durham, wanted me to give money to this, this campaign. And I brought up, I used to have a portrait of Lyndon Johnson behind me. And this guy was a staunch conservative Republican. And he's telling me why I should give him money. And I said, You know what that is? That's Lyndon Johnson. He's telling me not to give you any money. And he should have, you should have noticed that when you came in here. But I said, have you ever read Profiles of Courage? Book officially written by John Kennedy, probably written by Ted Sorensen. But it, it, it profiles a handful of US senators that led knowing they were going to get totally defeated and not be reelected. But they did the right thing. And I, made, I maintain that everybody who runs for public office at any level should have to read Profiles of Courage. So this guy wanted money from me. So 
I wrote him a check for $25, and I tucked it inside a copy of Profiles and Courage, and I mailed it. A couple weeks later, he was at the ballpark, introduced me to his fiance, and I said, did you read Profiles and Courage? And he said, no. Crazy. Sure, right. So you guys should read Profiles and Courage. <laughs> the other book I think you should read is a book called October 1964. It's written by David Howard, one of the great modern era historians. Made his name on the Vietnam War in a large degree. But October, see, he's a big baseball fan, big sports fan. He's written books on basketball and a couple books on baseball. But October 1964, that's the year of the Civil Rights Act and the Voting Rights Act that followed a year later under President Johnson. But it, it goes inside the, the New York Yankees and the St. Louis Cardinals who met in the 64 World Series. And it puts all of that into perspective of what's going on in the country at that moment, socially and historically. If you read those books, and you can read them as baseball books or sports books if you want to, you're going to learn history at the same time. That's the power of the game of baseball. On many different levels, there are dozens of books, some of them called Willie's Time, it's about Willie Mays that does the same kind of treatment. 